from blades to hire to dispensers of justice for the greater good, and from edgelords to hitmen, let us talk about assassins. Hello all you funky people out there, Funky Monkey here, welcome to today's episode. How are you? How was your week? I am really glad to have you all here today. On today's episode we'll be talking about one of the most beloved classes in TTRPGs and MMORPGs, games, movies and legends in general, the Rogue. Well, actually a subclass of the Rogue, the Assassins. Now prepare for a journey into the origins and history of one of the most romanticized professions out there. Just as a fair warning, the story around the origins of Assassins is much much less epic than the legends woven around them, but still very impressive. So just keep that in mind moving forward. We won't be talking about epic takedowns, but about how the legends were born. Oh, and there's more myth rather than history known from that particular period of time, as many of the sources have been lost over the centuries, but what we do know is really worth it. But enough about that, we are here for stories, not disclaimers. This video will also be a little more special thanks to what I will be doing in the background. You see, I'm a man of many skills and talents and instead of painting a miniature I will be making my first dungeon tiles. It will involve some painting too, so don't worry if that's what you're here for. Hope you will love the process, see how easy it is and be inspired to make your own dungeon tiles. I took inspiration from Black Magic Craft in case you were wondering and I will leave a link to his channel in the description below. Now, do me a favor. If at any point you like this video and find the information valuable, hit that like button, subscribe and share with your friends, your players, your DMs, your GMs, your neighbors, grandparents, cousins, pets, everyone, so you help me grow this funky community and with that let's talk about what my plans are for making these tiles. I am using SPS foam or extruded polyester, as the other kind, the one made up of small polyester balls. You know what I'm talking about, does not work in this case. I'm also using a hot wire cutter for this task, but if you don't have something like this, don't be discouraged. A sharp knife or box cutter and patience will get you the same results. The wire cutter just significantly cuts down the time spent, well, cutting. When I started experimenting with XPS foam, I found some discarded pieces close to a construction site and I managed to dull my cutter while playing around with it, so it is possible, you just need patience. Now, I like my hexes to be a little larger than 1 inch by 1 inch or 2.5 cm by 2.5 because sometimes I make custom bases for miniatures or if I place a larger miniature next to a normal one, it looks funky, you know what I mean. Plus, it's easier to cut in whole numbers instead of decimals, so I went with 3x3 3 3 or 1.18 inches. I'm also trying to make sure to keep the factory faces of the foam as the faces of the tiles. If you have the large light green foam, the factory faces are the really shiny one and its opposite. For other variants, well, the one that has the writing on it is the factory face. These faces retain indents really well, and unless you really want smooth flex stones, I would give them some texture. Because the hot wire cutter leaves very smooth surfaces and sharp edges and corners, I want to weather the tiles a little before using and painting them, so I turn to my trusty stone tumbler. I got a cylindrical box, but it can be any box you have, and I got some rocks, some stones. I do need some smaller ones, but I'll make do with what I have. Just place the tiles in, but not all of one at once and throw in the stones, then just get your cardio for the day. Shake the box vigorously for about 30 to 40 seconds and voila! Your tiles are weathered, no more smooth surfaces and sharp edges. But as you can see it took me a few goes before I was happy with the results. Now because it's still not enough, get one of the more jagged stones, place the tiles with the face you want upwards and start making indents. The more random, the better. Then, my advice is to take a bag or a box, throw all the tiles in, mix them up and draw them out as you need them. This way you are really getting random patterns. It's not that difficult and it doesn't take that long, but I do recommend you use a mask or some mouth and nose covering, as there will be a little bit of dust and you really don't want to inhale that. Now for the story. With the plan laid out, 
it's time to go through the checklist. I don't have any coffee today because it's quite late in the evening, but I do have some awesome rose tea in my mousse cup. I have something something for the soul and I have one of my lovely assistants right over there, not fully in the picture, but close enough. How about you? Are you all comfy cozy and with something nice to drink on hand? Perfect, then I think it's time for a story. The word assassin has its origin in the 11th century Iran, but more widely they were initially known as Nizari, after a certain event in history, but we'll get to that. We need to go through a bit of background, so bear with me, it's very winding, so if at any time, any moment you feel like you lost track, just rewind and rewatch the parts that you didn't really understand. There's a lot of information and, as I mentioned, it's quite winding. Islam was divided after Muhammad's death in two main groups, each with multiple subgroups throughout history. These two groups were the Sunni on one hand and the Shiites on the other. They were divided based more or less on politics rather than religion, and it was based around whom they believed was the real leader after the death of their prophet. The Sunni were those who believed that Muhammad's uncle, Abu Bakr, was the one who should lead them, while the Shiites were those who believed that the cousin and son-in-law of the Prophet, husband of Fatima, Muhammad's daughter, Ali, should be the one to lead them. The Sunni also believed that the leader of the community should be elected by the community, having to earn their position. And as long as the essence of the Quran was followed, there was some wiggle room that allowed for a slight variation in behavior. In contrast, the Shiites believed that the Muslims, or actually each individual Muslim, should have an Imam to teach them the Quran and not try to interpret them alone as to not stray from the real teachings, thus limiting variation. And they also believed that the Imam was a position one individual was born into. It was a hereditary right. These main two groups then, over time, further divided within, leading to multiple subgroups, as I just mentioned before. At one point in history, there was a split within the Shiites group, because an Imam decided to disinherit one of his sons, Ismail, because he liked wine a little too much. By doing so, the Imam basically named his second son, Musa, as heir. Of course, there were those who still followed Ismail and did not recognize Musa as he was the second son. But chance had it that Ismail died before his father did, and so he could actually never be his heir, but his followers did not rejoin the flock and accept Musa. They continued on their own path. They took the name Ismaili after their now dead leader and believed that there was a hidden bloodline of Imams that would eventually step into the light and lead the world. Until then, the visible Imam was gone, but their faith was as strong as ever. Then, another split took place, this time between Musa's followers, in 874. That was the moment when the twelfth of their Imams, Muhammad al-Mahdi, vanished. This was the 12th direct descendant of Muhammad, part of his bloodline. Upon his vanishing, a group of his followers started believing that the Imam would return at the end of times and decided to wait for him, distancing themselves from politics as they no longer had a direct interest. Their leader would return at the end of times. Thus, they became known as the Twelvers. To spice things up, the Twelvers considered another group, the Ismaili, to be heretics through and through and were sworn, I wouldn't go as far as say enemies, but they were rivals, sworn rivals. But why am I telling you all this? Well, I am tempted to say that I'm doing this because I want to make things easier, but it's anything but simple. The idea is that the father of assassins, Hassan e Sabah, was initially part of the Twelvers and was thought to hate the Ismails with passion. But at the age of 17, he converted to Ismaili and eventually became a teacher of the Ismaili faith. Upon converting, he swore an oath to the Fatimid Caliph, Al Mustansir, seated in Cairo. This individual will come into play later. Around this time, the Seljuk Turks started taking over significant parts of the Islamic world. 
they were Sunni, so there was more of a wiggle room when it came to the Quran teachings, but they were Orthodox Sunni and didn't really like Christians or Jews. Oh, and they wanted to make all Shiites walk the Sunni path once more, rejoin the flock. By the way, Orthodox comes from the Greek Orthodoxos and is a compound word formed of ortho, meaning straight, true, right, and doxa, meaning opinion, and translates as having the right opinion. The Seljuks were a Turkish tribe from Central Asia that around the 11th century invaded southwestern Asia and parts of the Middle East. They captured Syria, Palestine, most of Iran and Mesopotamia. This was the beginning of the Seljuk rule in the Middle East and for the next few hundred years they were in charge until the Mongols kicked their behinds and later the Ottoman Turks rose to power and created the Ottoman Empire, but that's another story for another time. Anyway, their seat of power was in Baghdad and their rulers were the Abbasid Caliphs. Hassan Sabah was tasked with gathering information about the Seljuk military capabilities and was sent to different settlements in Persia, where the Seljuk would operate in the mid-1080s. He was sent by his caliph al-Mustasir. He slowly started converting locals to Ismaili and established a following. In 1087 he was operating in the region of Dailam, far from the areas that Seljuks controlled. He started planning his own methods of dealing with the Seljuk and in 1090 he conquered the fortress of Alamut, the teaching of the eagle, through infiltration. He converted one by one the soldiers of the fortress over time and when he gave the signal they simply turned over the fortress. Quite impressive if you think about it. Once the fortress was seized, he improved its defensive capabilities and improved the irrigation system in the Alamut Valley, making it self-sufficient when it comes to food production, in case of prolonged sieges. Moreover, he also established an impressive library in Alamut, equipped with state-of-the-art scientific instruments and many manuscripts. Oh, one legend tells that he created one of the most beautiful gardens in the world here, with a river of water, a river of wine and one of honey. He would drug young people with opium and bring them in the garden. Upon them awakening, he would convince them that this was paradise and if they want to inhabit it, they should obey him and follow his orders. Then they would be drugged again and brought back to the real world." End quote. This way, legend has it, his followers were convinced to become assassins with the promise of returning to paradise if they fell while carrying out their missions. Of course, this is a legend that hasn't been confirmed, especially when it comes to the river of wine and honey, but it was meant to somewhat explain the origins of the assassins. We'll see this and come back to this later. His revolt against the Seljuks was also considered a revolt of the Persian population against the Turk invaders. This can be concluded by the fact that Hassan and his followers received much local support in the early years of their movement and throughout their existence. These populations became the Persian Ismaili. After Alamut was consolidated, Hassan i Sabah started taking over other strongholds and building new ones whenever he found suitable locations and converting more and more of the population to his religion and cause, especially in Rudbar, the area around Alamut. Soon after he established Alamut's fortress as his seat of power, the first of many clashes between Hassan's, Ismailis and the Seljuks took place, with Alamut being raided. But let's take a few moments and talk about what I'm doing with these tiles and then we'll resume our story. But before we do so, I want to know, did you know why Islam broke into two different factions? Did you know about Abu Bakr and Ali? If you did, leave a comment down below as I'm very curious how many of you actually know the origin of the two main factions. Now, let's go to the tiles. After making the tiles, I came in with Mod Podge mix with black acrylic paint to harden the surface. You don't really need this, you can just use black paint and that's it, but the Mod Podge hardens the foam a little as it is a glue, varnish and finisher all in one. Quite a good investment to be honest. It is pretty hard to get hold of over here, but I did find a small craft store that imports it. And whenever I get a chance, I get a big tube that lasts me a few projects. 
the Mod Podge I got is white by default, so I mixed it with black acrylic paint so I don't have to base coat after it dries. So I'm checking two boxes at the same time. If you do this, make sure you use a paint that is high in pigment, otherwise you might run the risk of adding too much acrylic and think the Mod Podge too much. Not a huge problem, but it depends what you are using it for. I wanted to add a little more weather into the tiles so I mixed up some burnt umber with ochre to give the sense of dust that settled on the tiles of this ancient forgotten dungeon. I am dry brushing this on very lightly as I want to give it depth not recolored. The brush I'm using is the cheapest I could find at the Home Depot and it's not the best brush to be honest, but for these kind of projects you don't want to use expensive brushes or you will ruin them. Just get a few different sized brushes that you won't cry over when ruined because eventually, believe me, you will ruin them. And do get a glove unless you really want to paint your hand. Oh! Earlier I also divided my tiles in two batches, setting aside the ones with deeper indents for something special later in the video. In total I set aside 12 tiles and I got an extra one that was ruined by the first varnish I used. I have some ideas on how to repair that. Once this stage is done, I will come in with a very very light dry brushing of pure ochre and finish everything off with stone grey before moving on to the special part of this project. Let us continue. In 1091, Hassan sent one of his most trusted lieutenants, Hussein Kwaini, to his native lands and gathered support there. The mission was very successful and it actually led to an uprising against the Seljuks, giving Hassan control over several settlements in the area of Kwahistan. Thus, two years after he took over Alamut, Hassan and his Ismaili controlled two regions that declared independence from the Seljuks, and he established an independent state within the territory of the Seljuk Sultanate, right in their midst. Following this uprising, the Seljuks sent expeditions against the Ismaili, of course, in both regions to root them out and laid siege to Alamut, but the fortress held strong. Hassan managed to smuggle his wife and daughters out of this fortress while under siege and hid them in an Ismaili community where they earned a living by spinning. Thus, a new tradition was born, that of not allowing women in the fortress. The campaign against Hassan came to a halt when the Seljuk vizier Nizam al-Mulk was assassinated by Hassan's Fidais. Fidais are the faithful soldiers. And the Sultan died a few weeks later, perhaps poisoned at Hassan's order or perhaps of natural causes. These deaths sparked a period of internal strife and conflict with the Seljuk ending up fragmented with local chieftains following their own interests and with the three sons of the sultans fighting amongst each other for control of their father's inheritance. This presented Hassan with an awesome opportunity and he took advantage of it. He consolidated and expanded his power in Rudbar, where he took over the fortress of Lanvasar, west of Alamut, and with the Persian Ismailis also taking over multiple strongholds such as Gedku and Arajan. Now, let's talk about his method of pushing back the Seljuks. He decided to remove them one by one, sending instructions and orders from Alamut to his followers infiltrated in different strongholds of the Seljuks. The favorite method was poison whenever possible, but a good old dagger in the chest was also employed when need be. Another way of avoiding confrontations was to intimidate the Seljuk leaders. Waking up and finding a clear sign left by an assassin was sometimes enough to halt the plans of retaliation or a plan of rooting out of Nizari. This was done because Hassan identified the weakness of his enemies, the fact that they were decentralized and many small local leaders had their own interests that they tried to accomplish. At the same time, the Seljuks were vastly outnumbering the Nizari. The best way of making sure that the enemies were off balance was to eliminate the most promising leaders and commanders that threatened Hassan and his followers. This was again a very very effective technique because of the fragmentation of the Seljuks. 
But unfortunately, every assassination attempt, whether successful or not, led to massacres of the Ismaili population at the hands of the Seljuks. This in response led to more assassinations carried out by the Fidais. It was a vicious circle. As you might imagine, the Nizari were not liked at all by the Seljuks, nor the Sunni population, as shown in two quotes from the sources that survived. One of them goes like this. To kill them is more lawful than rainwater. The second reads, to shed the blood of a heretic is more meritorious than to kill 70 Greek infidels. This paints a pretty clear picture of the opinion around Nizari, doesn't it? This whole situation allowed Hassan to extend his influence hundreds and even thousands of kilometers away, with him taking over Damgam Fortress 500 kilometers away to the east and Khuzestan 1000 kilometers to the south. He also had his sons executed in this period. One of them, Muhammad, was found guilty of drinking wine. And I mean, if your dad has a river of wine in his splendid secret garden, who wouldn't take a sip from it from time to time? The other, Ustad, was suspected of murdering Hassan's loyal lieutenant, Hussein Kwaini. I mean, assassins will assassinate, wouldn't they? Anyway, let's talk about how they ended up called Nizari. Well, in 1094, a new schism appeared within the Ismailis group. This year, the Fatimid Imam Caliph Al-Mustasir, the guy from before, died. And his two sons could not agree upon succession. Actually, they could agree upon succession, but the Caliph's vizier didn't like the succession. Hassan chose to support and recognize the eldest son of the Caliph, Imam Nizar, his eldest son while the vizier Al-Aftal supported Mustali. And eventually, the Fatimid Caliphate recognized Mustali, who was also the vizier's son-in-law. Because Hassan was the de facto leader of the Persian Ismaili, by following Nizar, he basically created an independent branch of the Ismaili that was rooted in Persia and Iraq. This branch came to be known as the Nizariya. Now let's talk about the relationship between the Nizari and the Crusaders because, as you might imagine, they had sort of a relationship. And, as you will find out, it was quite interesting. But before we do so, let's go to the tiles and talk about the progress I have made. But before we do so, what do you think of the story thus far? Do you think that the Sultan was assassinated or did he die of natural causes? Were Hassan's Fidai soldiers so good that they managed to get to the Seljuk Sultan and actually assassinate him? Leave a comment down below as I am very curious to hear your thoughts around this. Now for the tiles. Now for the special part of the project. First I will set aside the tiles that are done, the ones that I will leave like this, classic dungeon stone tiles. Nothing fancy, nothing weird, but still awesome, at least in my opinion. But now for the part I am really looking forward to. I'm starting with Pebeo White, mixed with a little bit of water just to ensure nice consistency, and I'm applying it to the deepest indents, although selectively, not all of them. I'm going for the thinner consistency because I want the paint to really hug the sides of each indent, leaving as much detail as possible, trying to not just slap paint in there and move on. I'm really loving this paint, it is by far the best white I have, it applies very smoothly, it has good opacity, good consistency, good quality for the price, I can't recommend it more. I don't know if it would work with an airbrush, so don't cross me out if it's not good for it, but enough about the paint. I'm looking for the most promising feature on each flagstone, things that make them more interesting, make the whole tile stand out more. I'm not necessarily going for a pattern, actually I'm doing my best to avoid patterns, but I am making sure there is a logic to how I apply the white. For example, if I'm applying paint to the edge of a flagstone, or between multiple flagstones, I'm using a little bit more water just to allow the paint to flow naturally in the grooves. I will go through every tile I've selected and repeat this process until I'm happy with it. Then I will set aside the white and move to a different, more interesting paint. Just as a hint, I took some inspiration from this week's Time Walking Dungeons in World of Warcraft. I'm curious if you can guess what inspired me. Let us continue. Hassan's 
influence began spreading in Syria in the first part of the 12th century, with his followers converting the population and building mountain strongholds wherever they found it suitable. After a half a century of efforts, the Nizari took over some settlements and strongholds in Syria too, with the most important being Masyaf. This was under the control of Rashid ad-Din, an assassin who attempted multiple times to take out Saladin himself, but with no success. The Crusaders started noticing the Nizari in Syria in the late 12th century, but didn't really engage with them too often as the Nizari rarely attacked Christians. In time, the Nizari in Syria actually collaborated with the Crusaders on occasion, as they had the same enemy, the Seljuks. You know the saying, the enemy of my enemy is my friend. Although there is one famous game around assassins that shows crusaders and assassins as being sworn enemies, they actually, in reality, try not to get on each other's toes. In 1128, the Nizari-led city of Banyas was on the brink of falling under the control of the city of Damascus. Rather than letting this happen, the Nizari in the city gave it to Baldwin II, crusader king of Jerusalem, thus refusing the Damascians an important prize. From 1152, the Nizari in Syria started paying tribute to the Templars after one of the few assassinations against Christians, when the assassins took out Count Raymond of Tripoli. After this happened, when the Hospitallers took over the fortress of Crac de Chevalier on the border of the territory controlled by the Nizari, they also demanded tribute. By the 13th century, the Nizari were still paying tribute and tried to end this by sending envoys to King Louis IX of France, who was on crusade in Acre. They kinda threatened the king and asked for the stop of the tribute or else, but as you might imagine, this did not sit well with the king, of course. But, surprisingly, the envoy was sent back with gifts and a non-aggression pact between the king and the Nizari, at the suggestion of the Templar Grand Master. The envoy was a Persian-speaking priest who also attempted to convert the assassins, but to no avail. The Nizari continued paying tribute until the fortress of Crac de Chevalier fell in 1271. And the Nizari as a people was scattered in the 14th century when the Mongols conquered all of their strongholds and territories, or actually most of them, those located in Persia. Up until then, for around 166 years, they sowed terror among the Seljuk Turks because no one knew when or where the Nizari will strike. They took pride in their skills and although always prepared for each mission as if it were their last, did not seek out martyrdom nor would they engage in random assassinations. They would strike only at their main target and not at random people or civilians. So, murder hobos out there? Take note. As for the name, assassins, there are two main theories. One of them revolves around drugs, more precisely hashish, implying that they use drugs to enhance their bravery, their skill and resolve. But that has been debunked because, well, hashish does not bolster your courage or determination. It mellows people out. Kinda strange when thinking of highly skilled individuals who meld into the shadows, infiltrate heavily guarded fortresses to strike at very well defended people, even sultans, while trying to cope with the munchies. But of course, most likely this was done in order to slander the name of the Nizari Fidai soldiers, essentially calling them junkies, but in a medieval Middle Eastern fashion. The name stuck and from Hashish we got Hashishin and later Assassins, or the users of Hashish, or, again, junkies. Although the chances of them being on drugs or the drugs available on the medieval Middle Eastern market pumping them so much that they risk their lives to assassinate political enemies are slim to none. But of course, maybe there were some who used drugs to get in the right state of mind, but this is applicable throughout time and space to soldiers of every nation. The second theory mentions that it comes from their leader Hassan, implying that they were called Hassassins or the followers of Hassan, but this doesn't really hold water. They were also called Mulahid, both by Muslims and by Christians, a word learned by Christians from the local Muslim population and it meant heretic. 
as for why they didn't often or at all strike at Crusaders, there are some theories that mention it would have been useless, as Crusaders had the centralized leadership and even if they eliminated, let's say, the Grand Master, another equally well-trained individual would rise up to take his place, while also drawing the Crusaders' ire. They didn't need nor wanted two enemies. Again, as mentioned before, the Seljuks were decentralized, with much internal feud. Taking out one of their leaders or commanders would trigger even more strife, and the one replacing a capable commander would not always be as capable, turning the Seljuks' attention far away from the assassins, giving them enough time and clearance to take over more territory and spread their teachings. The Nizari also fed the Crusaders' intel on the movements of the Seljuks, furthering their own agenda in the process. But perhaps it is because they were more interested in pushing back the Seljuk Turks, who were both invaders, and Sunni. And thus, the assassins used the presence of the Crusaders to push their own agenda. Now, let's go one more time to the tiles and start wrapping up our story. But before we do so, what do you think about the assassins thus far? Do you agree with the explanation around the origin of their names? Leave a comment down below as I am really really curious to hear your thoughts on this. Told you it's going to be an interesting paint that I will be using. Technical Tesseract Glow from Citadel. One of my favorite technical paints thanks to its color and vibrancy. The white base coat really enhances this paint and makes it pop even more. Although I could have gone and played around with paints a little more, adding darker shades to the sides of the indents, leaving only the center pure white to enhance the glowing effect, or even perhaps adding a little yellow to the edges of each indent to highlight it more, etc. I preferred adding pure tesseract over pure white and keeping it simple. Next time perhaps I will go a little further, but until then I am just loving how the tiles turned out. I can't wait for the moment I first lay them down on the table during the next D&D session and see the expression on my players' faces knowing that something bad is coming their way. By the way, not sure you noticed, but at one point I switched the PBO white paint with acrylic white ink because I wanted even more flow within the indents and features. Although still good, with PBO it would have taken me a little longer than I wanted, and I was already 3-4 hours in, so I wanted to expedite the whole process. The ink provided adequate coverage as well, just what I was looking for. Eventually I plan on adding some magnets to these tiles, make sure that they don't move around, but until then I will just be careful how I place my minis on them. And I will need some walls too, right? Dwarven Forge competition right here, hehe. <laughs> now back to the story and… let's wrap things up. Although Hassan's vision did not completely come to fruition, he was able to create an independent state. Although a state with a scattered territory, it still represented a massive blow to the Seljuk Turks. They could not take Alamut and conquer the territories of the Persian Ismaili, although they had massive military superiority. They never knew when the assassins would strike, and as such, the Nizari were a constant thorn in their side, a constant stress. So Hassan was somewhat successful. Besides an independent state, he also founded a new branch of Ismaili, that survived throughout the ages to this day. The history of assassins is long and complex, with many twists and turns involving political intrigue, espionage and assassinations. What I gave you is but a glimpse, a condensed version of 166 years of history and I didn't mention the 76 alleged assassinations carried out by the Fidais as there are very very few sources about them, at least from what I found. Hassan I Sabah died on June 12, 1124 and was buried close to Alamut, his seat of power. His mausoleum became a place of pilgrimage for Nizari until it was destroyed by the Mongols in 1256 alongside Alamut. The assassin order did not completely vanish, as they still remained active in Syria after all of this. But they did fade into legend. The rogue assassin doesn't have to be the classic edgelord, nor the fanatic. You can portray assassins as you please. But knowing their origin, their essence, 
They could be used to add more flavor to fantasy creation if that's what you're into. If you're a world builder, are there such orders in your world? Are there impregnable fortresses held by orders of assassins? Do they keep the balance in the world by striking at different rulers? Are they blades for hire or do they strive toward their own goals and ends? If you want to swap ideas, leave a comment down below as I'm very curious to find out more about your world. And if you're not a world builder, leave a comment down below with your thoughts on assassins and their origin. If you want to share, don't be shy and leave a comment. And with that, I would like to thank all of you wonderful funky people for the privilege of your time and I hope you found some inspiration and learned something new today. I can't wait to see you all here next time on Funky Monkey MP, the place where you get your dose of miniature painting, history, world building and trivia. Make sure you like, subscribe and share if you enjoyed this video. Remember, be curious, take inspiration from the past and never stop world building and creating amazing things, whatever those are. Your mind and imagination are wonderful. Have yourselves a wonderful, wonderful day. Cheers. But it does, but did this, or else, but did, but, or else.